I don't use these things very much. It's just one image I wanted to draw here, which some people in another workshop found, found helpful. And it's basically just to remind ourselves of the fact that, you know, here we've got Gaia with all her people. Gaia and her people, yeah? And here we have, you know, a series of national governments that, you know, from Sweden, you know, to, from USA to Sweden, India. So these national governments are meant to be representing their people. But what's actually happening is that we've got this bubble here of <coughs> interlinked banks and corporations. So we've got the, the TNCs that have become a sort of, <coughs> not just sort of, but a de facto government because they have been exerting pressure down on all these governments to give them more freedom and more wealth and power. Now, what we've been talking about is that the money that they're creating doesn't represent any real wealth. It's no longer representative of either human labor or resources. It's an artificial bubble. And that bubble now uh, is circulating quadrillions of dollars. I mean, it's beyond our, beyond our minds to comprehend what quadrillions of dollars mean. You know, this is huge amounts of wealth. And exerting pressure on our governments to allow them to create even more wealth and even more power. Now, the people inside this bubble, the people inside the TNCs, are not very different from the people outside of it. They are, you know, you can meet a small farmer who's doing a wonderful job on his biodynamic farm, but he may not be any less greedy than someone working inside Goldman Sachs or, you know, they, you will find people of all kinds inside and outside. And this is why it's really important, I think, that we move beyond this politics of identity that we have where there's far too much focus on the individual people and whether they are ethical, whether they're nice, whether they're... Of course, we want to encourage people to be kind and ethical, but it's so urgent that we start looking at the structural, the systemic, you know, the bigger picture, to start looking at what path are people representing are they genuinely in support of shrinking this completely undemocratic and unecological and uneconomic way of doing things? Are they on a path that's strengthening that or ignoring it, which is another way of allowing it to grow? So this is like this giant, I mean, I could, you know, in some ways, for many people, it feels like... in this systemic way through trade treaties. So remember, the trade treaties are absolutely central to this. <coughs> They're trade and finance, remember? Trade and finance. deregulation. Probably in the thousands, maybe about 10,000 people. Now, 10,000 people out of all of humanity is not even 1% of 1%. So we really have to say to ourselves, if we allow this to continue, there is something wrong with us. Well, what's wrong with us, from my point of view, is that we've not been equipped with the big picture. We've not been getting enough information about what's happening on the ground in Brazil, in China, in Sweden. I see so many people on the left 
in England and America, for instance, still thinking Scandinavia is the model. They don't know that because of the growth of this bubble of wealth, in Scandinavia too, governments have started ignoring what their people want, voting for the wars that the majority of people were against, voting, voting for nuclear power that the majority of people have said they don't want. So we had, you know, we have this lifting off of any, any democratic support because of this pressure on them. And that's been a quiet pressure that we haven't understood. We haven't been alert to voting or to discussing this. Now, this is why we believe that the number one strategy is education. The number one activism we need ed is education. And we see education of the holistic big picture. So I call it big picture activism. That big picture activism can start shedding light on this bubble and forcing our government representatives to start talking about the honest effect of these trade treaties. So we see the potential for education as activism to spread like lightning and to operate as a, as a, as a laser beam that will puncture this bubble. That you know, it's a, that's the sort of imagery, we just talked about it yesterday and came up with this, you know, imagery of the education being this laser beam that will puncture this bubble. Because what we've always said in this movement is that the minute that these treaties come out to the daylight, they simply can't survive. You know, in daylight meaning that people need to understand the implications. Now, the problem is that to understand this, you can't go and read the trade treaty. The trade treaty is already beyond any human comprehension. So the average minister in the average government has not read the treaties, and if they tried to read them, they would need a team of 100 lawyers who would decipher. And those lawyers, most of them are in the employee of this. So they're not going to be, they, you know, we have to be understanding both the structure and the implications, the impact of this. And that information you're going to get more from the grassroots, from people who have experience of both sides of the world. So the, the key in terms of education as activism is that not only do we need to shed light on this bubble, we need to shed light on literally millions of sources of light on the living planet and with living people. Millions and millions of sources of inspiration. And we need to be constantly reminding ourselves of the reality of that uh, and, and understanding the, 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 that nothing, nothing that these people can market comes out of this bubble. Nothing. It's air, it's hot air. It's controlling the media and with that military might, you know, pushing an agenda that is so crazy and so wasteful. Now, every last thing that is needed here to market comes from here. Every last thing. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that's being manufactured and sold that doesn't come from Gaia. And that doesn't come from a living organism that is diverse. Diversity is a principle and a fact of life. It is a diversity that is so rich that makes it this incredible ongoing miracle. Every moment when you open your eyes to being in the here and the now, in the living world, you see not only every leaf as unique, breathing and exciting and beautiful, but you see it's changing from moment to moment. Every cell in our body is unique and changing from moment to moment. It's an unbelievable richness and a story and a story. I'm a little bit tired of that word, by the way. But anyway, it's become one of those global memes that's been overused. But it is just this amazing richness that is a constant living, uh, 
it's, we, you know, when we open up to that outside of us, we also open up to it inside of us because part of what we begin to understand is that we are inextricably connected to that web of life. There's, there is, as I say, inside this, no real power. It's only that we're giving it the power through our ignorance. And, and remember, the, and the ignorance has included going back for generations to exterminate indigenous societies. Indigenous societies were, you know, truly embed, embedded in their place. They were truly localized and they were, um, in many cases, for thousands of years, sustaining themselves without threatening life on earth. But remember, as we have given more rights to this bubble, that has had led to that curve that we, we uh, you know, I just mentioned before, you know, this curve where the, this wealth creation towards the top, and, you know, where 62 people own more than half of the global population, it goes up in a curve like this, and then a curve down that mirrors it completely in the same timeline since 1971, the extinction of species. So when we're talking about the extinction of species, we're saying that this, um, that life itself is diverse. And so when we really, really understand that localizing, in other words, creating economic structures where the relationship between production and consumption is much closer, we're, of course, you know, massively reducing transport and energy. There's been huge propaganda from here to say, oh, no, no, it's better in the UK if you buy your lamb from New Zealand, because in New Zealand they use green energy. So don't believe these localists who tell you that local food economies actually um, mean less energy consumption. They even have done reports where they say, oh, no, no, it's fine for us to fly the shrimp from the UK to Thailand to be peeled. Because if you peeled it in England, we'd use machinery, and in Thailand it's done by hand. So therefore, this whole business of local food, reducing energy consumption is a myth. Even in my own organization, people were affected by some of those studies. And it's understandable in a way, but the, you know, and probably the study that said that lamb from New Zealand used less energy and le less carbon emitting energy was probably not a lie because they were contrasting large scale monocultures for export. They weren't looking at the small farms in the UK that were selling lamb locally and contrasting it. So it's, the problem with the dominant system is that it's not outright lies. The biggest way that this dominant system succeeds is through reductionism, is through narrowing the vision. And I saw how in Rio uh, in 1992, someone I knew quite well, Morris Strong, was the man who organized the meeting in Rio. And I, uh, you know, had lived in a place in Colorado that he and his wife had because they set up this institute that I was involved with. And I could see that he was concerned about sustainability. And as with many of my colleagues, the big leaders of the environmental movement, like the Jonathan Porritts and the Paul Hawkins and so on, everybody felt we've got to talk to power. And in the end, what happened is that the powerful managed to frame the agenda. And the powerful and the wealth framing the agenda was very often not through ill will. So I don't think we should be encouraging this idea that everybody who's a CEO or, you know, is a psychopath. We could think of them as psychopaths if we think of that simply as being out of touch with reality, not being forced to see that small-scale diverse farms produce far more food per unit of land than do big monocultures, for instance. Not being forced to see the relationship between policies they promote that are in the name of creating jobs, actually destroying far more jobs. You know, those things, you know, because they don't see that, they're so far removed behind a wall of numbers, all focusing on economic growth. So 
um, anyway, the, um, the um, point is that around the world, there are these, re- there, you know, there, there's a rebuilding of more localized systems. And of course, as we're saying, that doesn't mean that you can't have trade at a longer distance. Even in very sustainable, traditional, ancient cultures, it was amazing how long distance the trade was. In Ladakh, where I worked for many years, you know, they had these, their wealth was primarily in the form of turquoises, coral and pearls, and shells. They're high up in the Himalayas, far away from the sea. But those, those jewels were, were treasured and were a type of bank. You know, and they came from, some of the best coral came from Italy and the, um, the turquoises you know, from central China and so on. So trade per se is not the problem, but trade of importing and exporting identical products is the biggest crime on a planet with limited energy and massive problems with pollution. And why have we not heard more about redundant trade? Why? I argue it's all because the money that has funded various campaigns and that comes from often concerned people who are worried about biodiversity loss, are worried about poverty, are worried about, but they're managing to fund campaigns that focus narrowly and that in the climate movement have made the average citizen, particularly in the industrialized world, feel that the way Al Gore framed it, we've got to change our light bulbs, not drive our cars, not go on holiday, and then everything will be fine. I think that the majority of people could feel that that's not really where it's at, and that the majority of people were trapped in a system where it was very difficult for them to abandon their cars. Now, in the meanwhile, Al Gore, who I met once and tried to talk to about trade treaties, he was a passionate advocate of the trade treaties. When he did that film that so many people valued, uh, he did not talk about this humongous, globally transforming uh, change through trade treaties that were putting our jobs, essentially taking our jobs away from us and employing people on the other side of the world to do that work in a much more exploitative way. So it was both socially and environmentally massively destructive. That huge transformation of having virtually every sock, every head of garlic, every screw, every plastic shovel coming from China to the US to Europe. What do we think that meant to CO2 emissions? And what does it do to the discussion about, oh, the ecological footprint of the UK is this, of Sweden is this, it's meaningless. You'd have to go to China to look at those factories and then try to do a carbon footprint. We don't hear about that. And this is part of what's how the enclosure of our minds is the, really the biggest obstacle. And to me, that's an incredibly positive thing. I hope that you agree that changing people's minds and bringing an education is something that could happen very quickly. But we all need to become more strategic in how we get it out and how we can communicate a holistic uh, vision that, as Jay was saying, the key is that we're doing this in a way that is holistic because it can lead to these alliances. So even if your passion might be um, animal welfare, or your passion might be gay rights, or your passion might be poverty in the global south, or in or whatever your passion might be, in no way do you need to abandon that, but it's about framing it in the context of a bigger picture that can then appeal, especially to the people Jay was talking about, the people who are voting for Trump. And already years ago, um, we were talking about how the Christian fundamentalist community in the US who were becoming members of the Tea Party. They're really the, the background to Trump. If we could just reach them because 
They are fed up with big government. Why? This is where our message is very, very important. This is a key way of reaching those people, is to show that the regulations that big government is bringing in, that's destroying them, that are destroying them, come not from the left and the Greens, but come from here. We literally have many examples of big business lobbying government to bring in regulations at the national level. Because in the meanwhile, as they swing about here globally and move in and out and in and out of different local and national economies with no restrictions at all, they are lobbying these governments to regulate the place-based businesses. And this is one of the many, many reasons why, as we're in defense of strong local economies worldwide, you know, we're defending their right to life. Uh, Carmen was just talking about how small businesses in Brazil are just being, you know, destroyed. It's a picture everywhere. And most, well, I, I don't know if I can say most, but I can say a very large proportion of the people who are voting for Trump and for Brexit come from those small businesses and small farmers who see big government, in the case of Brexit, they see this big EU bureaucracy as the problem. But in many other countries, the right is coming out of that frustration. They see this over-regulation, and they see the left and the Greens as having lobbied government for regulation. And in many cases, it's true that Green and left have lobbied for regulations. And unfortunately, they weren't strategic enough. They weren't strategic enough to look at the um, how the global deregulation was the thing that we should be addressing first. And so much of their work to bring in regulation was, was really, uh, really aimed at these guys, but they ended up strangling, strangling the small guys. So that whole issue of regulations is a key way to reach those people. Now, I also want to say that when it comes to localizing, our great inspiration has been Ladakh and also Bhutan, where I worked for uh, over a five-year period. And, um, I, you know, I saw there, not just saw, I lived with and experienced people who were the happiest, healthiest, most vital people I had ever encountered. And I had already lived in quite a few cultures and spoke quite a lot of languages. Never, ever had I encountered this amazing... Uh, joie de vivre. And I learned to speak the language fluently in the first, well, actually very rapidly in the first half year. And that was just at a point when the area was, had been opened up to the outside. So they had not been colonized. They hadn't been developed. They hadn't been affected by this system. And I came to realize some of the key elements that provided for that incredible uh, health, uh, mental health, and well-being. And so, actually, I, I don't know if I need to write them, but maybe I'll just list them. You know, number one, I would say, was that life proceeded at a human and, therefore, ecological pace. They had much, much more time than we did. It was at a human scale. And the human scale meant an interdependence between people that was absolutely fundamental to the well-being, particularly with child growing up. There was an extended family, and the boundary between family and community and neighbors was much more permeable. We in the nuclear family, which is entirely a product of this system, the nuclear family has grown up exactly in line with the fossil fuel consumption, with the exploitation, the slavery, the genocide that goes behind it. The nuclear family creates a structure that almost cannot be healthy and sustained because you're creating this bipolar relationship between husband and wife, and it's almost impossible that you both need each other equally at the same time. And so when one person is busy in the outer world more and the other person is more needy, it creates you know, a need and an, a strain, and equally between parents and children. So you have a, a very, very different structure in the way we evolved. For most of our time on this planet, we had a much bigger group. 
And it meant that children based their identity on living role models instead of an idea of those people over there whom we don't really know and particularly reinforced by the media. So I saw how in Ladakh the media images played a huge role in making people feel stupid and backward, making them talk about themselves as animals. So by the way, this is a key element of our work, is to really understand the psychological impact of this consumer creation, the imagery that goes with it, that romanticizes urbanized consumerism. And key in that is schooling. Western schooling is part of that. So part of taking away the blindness from our eyes is deeply questioning Western schooling. And Western schooling is like a knife that cuts through collaborative, intergenerational community. When you put 31-year-olds in a room, they literally cannot help each other. It becomes elbows and scrabbling like this. That never, ever happened naturally. That came about as this bubble was built up, fossil fuels, the whole industrial thing, completely artificial, and it creates a friction instead of collaboration. What I experienced in the traditional context is a three-year-old looks up to the five-year-old and wants to emulate them, but never says, oh, I'm not as fast as, I'm not as good as. There's no expectation of being exactly the same as, because they're not in a monoculture. So there's a constant learning and teaching when you have that intergenerational community. And above all, what I lived with was this amazing, really, truly amazing and wonderful marriage between the 80-year-old and the eight-month-old. You know, they literally were both toothless, hairless, couldn't walk very well, very slowly. They were partners in life. That meant that very often the grandparents and the great-grandparents did more parenting than the actual parent. I would like to write a book just about that, but it's one of about 10 books I'd like to write from that experience. In the meanwhile, I have to keep going on about these boring trade treaties because they, you know, they're ex, you know, expanding. But there's a lot more to say about that. But the, so the community then key was the intergenerational part. Another aspect of this was that every child grew up connected to animals of all kinds, wild and domesticated, seeing them born, seeing them dying, seeing and being part of a life that included knowledge about the plants, the animals, the stars, the movement, the entire cosmos was alive. And connection to that is something that is happening now as part of the indigenous movement that also is happening at Schumacher, you know, where we start seeing the whole world as alive. We start also changing our mode of language to be more in tune, first of all, with silence and silencing the mind, which was another ingredient in their happiness, that, that there was a, an emphasis on a quieting of the mind, on a, a sort of spiritual, more contemplative way of being, but not in the segregated way that it happens in the West. It was a part of, even at a party, you know, you could be talking to someone and then for a while they're quiet and spinning their prayer wheel and sometimes even in a sentence they would move in and out of a more meditative, clearly different brainwave space and then back into the more communicative, analytical. So this, anyway, slower pace, quieting of the mind was an important ingredient. Another ingredient that was so clear was that most of the time you were moving. You know, you were, you were sometimes lifting heavy things you were, you know, we see it as quite hard work, but I tell you, once you've lived both sides, no doubt moving is better for us than sitting still in front of a computer. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that also contributed to the health and happiness. And so often we will say, oh, those poor people, they have to carry water. Oh, you know, it's like we've been taught to believe that it's total deprivation. It isn't. And... Um, Another aspect to all of this was celebration, especially through song and dance, and it was participatory. You know, everyone joined in. So the whole style, the whole modus operandi was not well-funded stars, you know, shining on a screen, but real flesh and blood people with their strengths and weaknesses. Some are prettier, some are funnier, some are more intelligent. And as a child, you grew up realizing that nobody is perfect and that you 
And it wasn't about perfection. It wasn't about shining. And I see too much of that in the New Age culture still. So much of the propaganda is, you know, come and learn how you can follow your passion and you too can shine, you know, you too can be somebody. The true being is in, in connection with others. The true joy comes in that sense of interbeing rather than, you know, standing and shining. And this is a really important part. And I want to say for us to get back to that deeper interbeing and sharing and community building, a key element is being willing to be more vulnerable and to share more our deeper fears, not think that anybody out there is going to be put off by hearing that you have some anxiety or that you're nervous about your performance or that you have an eating disorder. Most women in the Western world have an eating disorder. This is including me. I mean, I, I've never had to go to extremes, but I've never since my teens been able to have a relaxed relationship with food. Always worrying, having, you know, that imagery of, of how you have to be, you know, it's just really crazy. And out, even living in Ladakh, where there were no mirrors, it was so much easier, you know, to, to live a life where, where you, you, you're not so concerned with image, you know, it's really... And let me just see if I have one more reminder of some of the other aspects of life. And, you know, most of these things I'm describing, we can actually regain now. You know, we, these things don't have to cost money. And so a big, big part of what we want to... Um, well, another sort of aspect that is both an effect of the way they lived, but also something that was valued, was even in their iconography, in their iconography in Buddhism, was a balance between male and female. And so that there, there was a very clear understanding that male and female brought different qualities, but that we needed a balance between the two. And, and that played out in ways that anthropologists who come out can't understand because there was often a situation where women would sit separately from the men and so on. And what I'm painting here is, of course, not a paradise of perfection. I have to say, though, that the honest truth is that I would prefer to be reborn as a traditional Ladakhi rather than a, a, a traditional Swede. You know, and in Sweden, we had a pretty good status for women. We had, you know, everything was pretty good. But we had already been herded off the land into high-rise buildings. I mean, we didn't live in a high-rise building, but the majority. And, you know, small-scale agriculture had already been destroyed. So that deeper connection to nature and to community <coughs> had already been killed off. So, uh, and, and the thing is today, what we're looking at in terms of rebuilding the local is we now have such an awareness of the need for diversity, for instance. There is a potential by rebuilding particularly small-scale food production with respect for the local, but also being willing to experiment. Not fundamentalist, you know, only indigenous, because what is indigenous anyway, and yet not reckless either. But anyway, highly diversified production systems, particularly food, fishery, and forestry, you know, which provides our, all for all our basic needs. Never ever on this planet has any society tried to do that. So we can actually do something that will be different from the indigenous people who had so much more space than we did. But what we can do is something that is already demonstrating itself as being amazing, miraculous. You know, there's a farmer in Japan who by diversifying totally, including animals, by the way, is demonstrating that Japan could easily feed itself. <clears throat> so this diversification now also adding to that, carefully adding technology, you know, renewable energy-based technology, decentralized, it is amazing um, what we could create. Really, you know, the best of the old and the best of the new. I think the potential is great. I would warn against a completely uncritical path towards believing that the internet, 3D printing, that those technologies are our savior. We need to use them for communication, but we should be careful that we don't uncritically allow them to continue to expand into our, into our society. So I, um, uh, yeah, I guess the final thing 
that I will have time to say now is that, um, <coughs> yeah, it's, it really is that this aspect of vulnerability is a really important key. And remember, it's linked to being more interested in community building than individual shining. The, the individualism in the West is still a huge obstacle for us, you know, to make genuine progress. And I think genuine progress towards genuine happiness is not just about how we can become more political and so on. It's actually how can we become more deeply happy? Um, and every psychologist really will know this, that when people have good relationships with other people, that that's an absolutely essential ingredient in happiness, particularly for children to develop healthy identities. So I feel that with a big picture, we can offer, you know, incredible, for free, wealth creation. Um, and I know we'll be talking more about how important it is to reinforce this spiritual, ecological, and, and, and psychological enrichment through building local economies. And it's happening around the world. You know, the structures of rebuilding local economies provides the framework that makes it easy to build community and to connect to nature. And it can happen in big cities, but do keep in mind that urbanization is one of the tools of this system. And part of what they're already doing is putting out the message to idealistic architects, ecologists, across the board. The message is coming from here, urbanization is the way forward. That on a crowded planet, we've got to be creative and build green, smart cities. That is part of a propaganda that goes against us. Strengthening existing towns and villages and ultimately shrinking the scale of some of our mega cities is a way to reduce our ecological footprint and to increase our well-being. Anyway, thank you very much. That's <laughs> why.